They knew this child had been abused. They knew she was living with her abuser. They sent her home every Sunday. Did they send her anywhere where she could actually feel safe enough to confide in what was happening? They never did. This young woman, who we're calling Jane, was sexually abused by her father from the age of five. Not long after that began, her father Paul confessed to the bishop at their Mormon church. But the church didn't report it to the police. It would take years for the truth to come out. I don't understand how anyone in their right mind can blatantly ignore the safety of a child especially within a church that's supposed to be loving and accepting and welcoming and just supposed to take care of its members. But they didn't do that for my family or me at all. Did you have any belief that Paul was doing anything like this? Did you have any signs? Other than what may have passed between him and I as confidentially as bishop, okay. no. When a child is abused, there are laws in the U.S. that say people in trusted professions have to report it to authorities. But when it comes to clergy or religious officials, sometimes the law allows for abuse to stay secret in the name of religious freedom. The idea of a higher power and salvation and there being more to this world than just our day to day has essentially been perverted in this fashion that the salvation of an individual matters more than the salvation of a victim. To keep child abuse a secret is what makes the church complicit in the spreading growth of child abuse. All of my keepsakes, family photos that I have left from when I was a Jehovah's Witness. What about this one? I was probably 14. It was just before. Yeah, just before. What was your mindset like before it happened versus after? There was that change of um, being carefree and the world was safe, you know? And I didn't really feel like I had to hide things. Mariah was raised in Washington State in a family of Jehovah's Witnesses, yeah. a Christian denomination known for being insular. So Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe that everybody goes to heaven. And in 2012, when she was 14, she met a 25-year-old man named Eliu Rodriguez at her father's congregation. He started to hang out with the younger girls Sometimes he'd be assigned into the same service group that I was assigned to, so we'd get in the car and we'd go door to door preaching. He spent a lot more time trying to pursue my attention at the Kingdom Hall, and then it started to progress, and so Elliot suggested that maybe we start texting. Did you think it was strange at all that a 25-year-old man wanted to text with you? It was strange, but being 14, my head was more in the space of, oh, he likes me, and I didn't understand the inappropriateness of it. The way it was done seemed like he really was just trying to get to know me. It was very subtle, but then it started to develop a little bit more where the, the conversation started to steer to a more sexual place. Um, so the flirting... Mariah told us he convinced her they were in a romantic relationship, but that she couldn't tell anyone about it. There are those feelings where, whether it's you want to say it's your gut or that little voice in the back of your head that is telling you something's not right. For me, it's a sinking feeling in my heart and, you know, a pit in my stomach. And it occurred, you know, when Ellie would try and escalate things. The first time that he actually raped me, there was this feeling of I needed to scream, and I didn't. And granted, like, your body and mind go through a lot of different things when you're going through trauma. 
Mariah 15 with Hillary and Father, annual memorial of JWs, of the yeah. Jehovah's Witnesses. When you look at this picture now, knowing everything that was going on, what do you think? Looking at yourself there. I just look so young. I just look so young. I didn't have any eating disorders until the abuse occurred. And then the stress of keeping it a secret and the stress of meeting up late at night. Yeah, I was very exhausted and very depressed. Yeah. That's a lot for a 15 year old yeah. to go through. Yeah. And to not be able to tell anybody. Mm -mm. Yeah. How did you cope during that time? The abuse stopped when Mariah was 16 and moved across the state to live with her mother she finally shared what had happened to her. So after I had that conversation with my mom, she said, we're gonna get through this together and you're gonna have to call the elders. Elders are the local leaders for Jehovah's Witnesses congregations. This is an adult man who had a very inappropriate relationship with a teenager who raped a teenager. So. How did they handle it? Did they go to the police? Did they report him? No, they did not go to the police. There was never once from the elders, the word rape never was spoken to me. I was never told that it was not my fault. I was never told that it was non-consensual. There was no talk of that. And the things that they said and the punishment that was given, I ended up being privately reproved. Did they talk about the age difference? Did they talk about this being a crime? No. Nothing. It would be years later, after Mariah decided to leave the religion, and when she was an adult, that she decided to call the police. Yeah. I'll never forget, I finally gave the report, and the man had been confused that took the report. And I was like, oh, he doesn't understand that this isn't a recent thing, this is a past thing. I said, I was 14 when this happened and he was 25. And the man's whole tone changed and he said, I understand and I'm so sorry that this has happened to you. And I remember pausing, I'm gonna cry. Um. <laughs> sorry. Um, I remember pausing and I just started to cry on the other end of the phone. And he said, no one's ever told me that before. And he paused and he said, what do you mean? And I said, no one's ever told me that it wasn't my fault. And he just paused and he said, I'm really sorry. But we're going to get you help and we're going to have someone investigate this for you. But yeah, that was the first time that anybody had ever told me that it was not my fault. In 2018, Ellie was charged and later pled guilty to three counts of child rape for both Mariah and another young girl at the same congregation. But then Mariah took another step. She filed a lawsuit against Jehovah's Witnesses, locally and the national headquarters. The charge was that the church had awareness. They knew or should have known that the Leahy had sexually abused other children prior to abusing Mariah and had the chance to prevent it, but didn't. They chose to take a path of really further victimizing Mariah and not doing the things that they should have done to protect her, including contacting the authorities. Mariah eventually settled out of court. The Jehovah's Witnesses declined our interview request and in a statement said they don't discuss specific cases of abuse and that they comply with child abuse reporting laws. We wanted to get a better understanding of how Jehovah's Witnesses handle abuse allegations and if her case is unique. It is the rule rather than the exception for elders not to report child abuse. It is almost Mark O'Donnell was born and raised in a family of Jehovah's Witnesses. It's been a decade since he left the religion, working to shine a light on how they handle sexual abuse allegations. These are documents involving the most heinous crimes against children that you can imagine. How did you get a, these files? These were all stolen. These are stolen these files? These are the stolen documents. In 2017, another Jehovah's Witness stole these documents from various congregations and sent them to Mark. They were stolen from Massachusetts. They offer a glimpse into what happens when elders receive information about abuse. They're interviewing a minor 14-year-old victim who is about to describe what happened to her when she was four years old, because it's bothering her. 
Did they penetrate your body? Answer, yes. Did Ernie? Answer, yes. Did Gary? Answer, yes. Were you ever threatened about telling anyone? Answer, yes. Gary, the other abuser, threatened to hurt my kitten if I told anyone. What is a child to do? The child has no agency. And what did they do with this information? So they conducted an internal church investigation and ultimately they did nothing with it. They very rarely ever report to the police an allegation. They have a very specific procedure and the procedure is, number one, they call the legal department in Patterson, New York. And what they're doing is they're advising these elders whether or not they have an obligation to report to the authorities. These are some extremely serious crimes, which would make the average person just shrivel up and cringe. Anyone, if a doctor or a nurse read this and it was their patient, they would immediately contact 911 or contact the local authority or Child Protective Services. But no, they strictly go by the cold and calculated rules of the Jehovah's Witness legal department, which says, are you under obligation to report? How long ago did it happen? And they ask all these details to determine whether or not they would even consider reporting. Whether clergy are obligated to report abuse to authorities is different from state to state. In Washington, they're not listed as mandatory reporters. So there's a list of mandatory reporters, including people like police or teachers or doctors, and clergy aren't on that list. What kind of impact do you think that that law has? I think it makes it easier for clergy to hide sexual abuse. And that really matters when there might be a church or an organization that wants to keep these allegations secret. In 2022, Wilson investigated cases of abuse within Jehovah's Witnesses congregations, including Mariah's, but also going back to the 1970s. And it was also surprising how often I would contact someone who was a former witness or a current witness who said, yeah, I know someone. I know someone who was abused, or this guy was at my congregation and it turned out that he had been arrested for child molestation before or something like that. So it was very present on everyone's minds. Insular communities, whether it's the Amish, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, the people trust their local elders, they trust their local bishops, they trust uh, you know, the, the system that they have in place. Um, so much so that there's room for too much abuse because they trust these people. Jane's fight to hold the Mormon church responsible for not reporting her abuse has been playing out in court for years. Here in Arizona, clergy are mandatory reporters of child abuse and can be held legally responsible if they don't comply. The case is Jane Doe 1 et al. versus the Corporation of the President of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. There's no question, no dispute, that Dr. Herod learned uh, of <coughs> severe child abuse around 2010 or 2011. I believe there's some whatever. But Arizona's mandatory reporting law comes with an exception. It's known as clergy penitent privilege. If clergy learn about the abuse in a privileged setting like confession, they don't have to report it. It was at church. It was between the penitent and the priest, so to speak, or the bishop. Paul Adams confessed that he had engaged in... During a counseling session in 2010 or 2011, Jane's father, Paul Adams, told his Mormon bishop that he had sexually abused her and made videos of it. She was five years old at the time. It seems like he made videos. This is audio of an interview with that bishop, John Herod, with federal law enforcement about seven years after Paul's confession. The bishop called a helpline set up by the Mormon church to deal with cases of abuse. He spoke to a church lawyer who told him he could not report Paul. They said you absolutely can do nothing except for encourage him to turn it in, turn oh, himself man. in. Okay, so it's your understanding 
that, and, and your legal counsel explained to you that w when confronted with a situation like that, uh, and, yeah. and I mean, we can call it what it is, you know, yeah. the sexual but, abuse of his children at his own hands. Whenever, yeah, if there's the kids, the, uh, anyone else tells me, then I can, but if it comes from him, then I can't. Okay. Instead of reporting the abuse, the bishop brought Paul's wife in for counseling, and then later handed the information over to the next bishop who took over at the church. I brought in the, the new bishop and said, hey, I hate to dump this on you, but. And that was the next bishop also didn't report Paul. Instead, the abuse continued. And when Paul and his wife had another daughter in 2015, he started molesting her when she was six weeks old. No matter how right you thought you were in that moment, choosing not to report the abuse, you weren't. You were wrong and you hurt us. Jane is Paul's oldest daughter, the one he admitted to Bishop Herod that he had abused. She's now 18. We're protecting her identity. I don't see how anyone can just ignore a child's safety like that. I was five. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't say anything. I knew it was wrong, but I couldn't put into words how wrong it was. And they knew that was wrong, but they chose not to do anything about it. When you found out that they didn't protect you, that they didn't speak out, how did you feel about that? I was, to say the least, horrified. How was that the right decision? Allowing someone to hurt me, to hurt my family. The abuse only stopped at least six years after Paul confessed to Bishop Herod, when a video Paul had made of the abuse was found in a police investigation across the world. There's a file on a computer in New Zealand, and we make an arrest thousands and thousands of miles away and stop the victimization. Facial recognition identified Paul on the video and he was arrested in 2017. But while he was awaiting trial, he died by suicide. Since then, the county has been looking into the church's role in keeping the abuse secret, starting with the first bishop. He did what his church compels him to do which is, hey, you know, I've disclosed it to them. They're the people that know, and now they're telling me on the phone, you can't say anything. Do your best to manage it. Which is unfortunately, frankly, to me, what directly led to the continued abuse. The church has said in statements before that they were adhering to Arizona law by not reporting the abuse. Is that accurate? It's complete and utter crap. We called the helpline and was told he couldn't disclose it because he could get sued because these are confidential communications, essentially. But when you look at the duty to report statute in Arizona, it provides absolute immunity for making a good faith disclosure. And then it's up to them. It is up to Dr. Herod to make a choice. Lynn Cadigan represents Jane and two of her siblings in their civil case against the church. Bishop Herod could have reported this abuse with zero liability. The only liability he was afraid of is his church in Salt Lake City being mad at him. He would have gotten a slap on the wrist from Salt Lake City. Bad boy. He wouldn't have been sued. He wouldn't have gone to jail. Nothing would have happened to him. The Mormon Church, also known as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, declined a request for an interview, citing the ongoing litigation. But in past statements, they pointed to actions they took including urging Paul Adams to turn himself in and eventually excommunicating him. The church has basically admitted that all the men on these committees that discussed Paul Adams knew about it, and they all admit that none of them reported it because they all claim that there's a privilege. The church has also insisted that Paul confessed one time and that they believed there was a, quote, single past incident of abuse but the county thinks their actions suggest otherwise. In fact, it was such a problem that the bishop who's outgoing tells the incoming bishop, hey, you need to watch out with this family, basically, that 
It's the Adams problem, as it were. The clergy penitent privilege has also prevented lawyers from getting important internal records and interviewing witnesses. The court recognized it. There is a privilege. The Mormon Church says it's their right to keep all of their paperwork quiet, all of their witnesses quiet, and they claim privilege on all their investigations of what happened. Who does that clergy penitent privilege law then, who is it protecting and who is it harming? It's only protecting the person who's going in and getting this off their chest, theoretically, so that then they can gain salvation. And in the meantime, it just hurts kids. And it keeps them hurting. And it protects their abusers for years and years and years. But how can saving Paul's soul be more important than saving his children? It's not just the Mormon church. The clergy penitent privilege has also been applied in cases involving the Jehovah's Witnesses and Catholic Church, even when a victim reports. What we're really dealing with here is a constitutional issue. This is at a much, much higher level. Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormon church and other churches will stop at nothing to protect the constitutional rights, which they are afforded in our country for religious freedom of worship. The question is, where do we draw the line? What if you're a religion that says, well, we practice animal sacrifice or we practice murder? We have to draw that line somewhere. We should not have one set of standards for doctors and nurses and teachers and another set of standards for churches. Because in the end, really, all of our institutions are sacred. In Washington state, after the reporting on sexual abuse within Jehovah's Witnesses communities here, the legislature began to consider making clergy mandatory reporters and also not to include clergy penitent privilege. A priest may say, go and sin no more, but the reality is that isn't what happens. And that child is in danger. Six other states and one territory already require mandated reporting of abuse or neglect of a child even during confession or the comparable context in other faith communities. It became clear that there was support for removing that exemption. And as it picked up steam, that's where it became controversial. State Senator Noelle Frame, a survivor of child sexual abuse herself, proposed the legislation. But a bill wasn't passed because of opposition to removing the clergy penitent privilege. Every single priest I talk to is willing to go to jail over this issue. This is an infringement on our Catholic tradition and our religious traditions. This is it was the Catholic Conference that was the most active in uh, opposing the form of the legislation that removed the exemption. The Catholic Conference in Washington declined our interview request but it's said that the exemption conflicts with the seal of confession. It doesn't work if they come in and, you know, with fear that somehow what they're saying, you know, could end up being uh, come to light. And so it's, it's, it's... Trying to pass the bill again will have to wait until the legislative session resumes. To pass a law with this gaping exemption for clergy penitent privilege, I think it allows faith communities to continue practices that allow the open and knowing abuse of children within their communities. We need to find a way to protect children and we need to do something now. It's not just Washington though. This same kind of battle around this law is playing out all across the country and lawmakers have been proposing bills to remove the clergy penitent privilege, but for the most part, it's the lobbying from the Catholic Church and the Mormon Church that has successfully blocked these bills from becoming law in, uh, all across the country. They don't want things known, and that's not new. Father James Connell is a Catholic priest in Wisconsin and has been active in trying to get legislatures to remove the clergy penitent privilege in state laws, and also thinks church law should change. Secrecy is part of human life, but when secret hurts an individual, protects the criminal, 
who should be held responsible in society, paying the debts of society, and further endangers other people because the police don't even know to look for the person, the criminal. That's the immoral use of secrecy. And those kinds of rules of secrecy need to be changed, need to be eliminated. His stance led to the Archbishop of Milwaukee taking away his confession rights earlier this year. He's continued to speak out because he says he sees this as part of the church's longer history of scandal and hiding abuse. The state laws that of clergy penitent privilege that protect us, they are in the long run delaying any improvement the Catholic Church will experience if they were to clean house and turn out, put out all the dirty linen. This isn't just about the Catholic Church, of course, but about how both religious institutions and lawmakers decide what matters most when it comes to protecting children. The statute is designed because kids often can't report their own abuse. They often can't. If you think a five-year-old can explain what rape is by a father, they can't. The entire purpose of the reporting statute is to give a voice to that little five-year-old who can't describe her abuse. She can't. Less than a month after we met Jane, the judge in the civil case ruled that the church was not liable for not reporting because of the clergy penitent privilege. Her lawyer plans to appeal. The hardest thing for me as a lawyer in this is trying to explain to a teenage victim how the courts have failed her, the church has failed her, her parents have failed her, and apparently the law may fail her that no one cares and no one protects her. So how do you get a young person to have faith in anything when the courts and the church are claiming the fact that her abuse is all over the world on the internet? That's not a secret. But whatever the church says about it is a secret, and what they did about it is a secret. And they have this clergy privilege that protects them. I don't think harm like this should be hidden because if it's hidden away, nothing will change, and it's just gonna keep going, and more and more people will continue to get hurt. 